Okay. So we're going to just pick right back up where we left off last class. And that is talking about Sheriff and Ashes studies. And remember, both of these studies were looking at conformity. But the difference between the two studies was um, really what was the um, stimuli in terms of was it ambiguous or was it unambiguous and so ambiguous would mean that it's really hard to tell it's hard to discern um it it's like you're just not sure because it could go any way and then unambiguous just means it is very clear uh and for example, if you're asked a question and there is a very clear answer. So in Sheriff's study, which we didn't really go into super detail about, this was a particular study where there was like a small, there was a screen and then there was like a light, a light on the screen. And it was really difficult to tell if the light, cause it was blinking and then it moves, but it, it's almost like, did it move? It, it was really hard to distinguish. And so in this case, when you had people together, in a group and and you had a confederate so it's somebody in on the experiment who answers incorrectly and they say oh i saw it move to the left okay when it's ambiguous then people are going to then be more likely to conform because they're just not sure and so the conformity occurred um in this case and they privately accepted that that was the right answer. So this was public compliance and private acceptance. They they complied with everybody else. They 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 said yeah they conformed. They said okay the 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 light moved to the left, and they personally felt that it probably moved to the left because it's really hard to tell. And if other people said it moved to the left, then surely it moved to the left. So sheriff studies was all about you know, um, being ambiguous and are people going to follow through, right? So in Ash's study, remember he had the line study and the examples that he gave for the sample line were very clearly different from what the Confederates were answering in the, um, in, in, uh, they, they were very, um, very clear, clearly the wrong answer. And so this is very unambiguous stimuli. They knew the answer was wrong. If you ask them later, they would say, I knew it was wrong, but I went with the crowd anyway, because um, they didn't want to look stupid. They didn't want, you know, they, they were just wanting to not be rejected by these strangers. Right. So in this case, there was public compliance, but there was no private acceptance because they knew that the answer was incorrect, but they were going along with the crowd and conforming anyway. So just because, you know, the answer is correct or not, doesn't necessarily mean that you're not going to conform. Right. So you might say to yourself, Hey, you know, this isn't the right decision to make, but you feel very awkward and you feel the urge to go ahead and conform anyway. Now, what happens if you're in a group of friends, right? And you don't conform to the group. Okay. So, and we're going to talk about this in a minute where we all have like a pass, right? We can, we can not conform so many times before it becomes a problem, right? So let's say that everybody, let's say you're in a group of friends and you guys all, um, uh, I don't know, do a particular activity together and, um, you have decided that you're no longer going to participate in that, at that activity. Okay. You're like, maybe all you guys do, you just go to the movies. That's what you do. You're always going to the movies and you're like, this is what we do as a group. And this is what we enjoy doing. Okay. And then you decide that you no longer want to engage in this activity. You're not going to conform anymore. You're not going to go along with the crowd. If you make that decision to no longer conform, what do you think your friends are going to do? They might let you get away with it a couple of times, but then at what point, at some point they're going to be like, mm, what's going on? So what do you think they're going to do if you go against the grain? And this can be any kind of thing where you're not conforming anymore to the group. So what do you, what do you think they're going to do?
Okay. You're okay. Um, so you're going to eventually, so I've got a comment here. You'll get progressively pushed out of the circle. Um, yes, eventually, but what, and, and I got another comment shunned out of the group, but that's not the first step. The first step isn't, oh, they're no longer going with us to the movies. They're out of the group. That's usually not the first step because you're allowed a few passes and then something's going to happen. There's going to be a change in the way that the group is going to respond to you. So before you get shunned, before you get pushed out of the circle, but you know, at, at a certain point, they're going to no longer invite you and they're no, no longer going to want you to, to join with them because you're going against, you know, the groups like what you do. So before you get shunned and before you get pushed out, what do you think they're going to do? Okay, so they might be, oh, come on. You used to come as like, you know, they might talk to you. There might be some discussions. They might be like, hey, what's up? You know, why are you acting differently, right? Um, they're going to try to bring you back into the fold. They're going to try to convince you to come back um, and to, to stop going against their grain, right? Here's another comment. They might confront you. They might ask you why you're not coming anymore. What's going on, right? So there might be a mix of some like just having kind of a heart to heart to you, or they might ask you blatantly, hey, what's going on? Um, there also may be some teasing, right? They might be like, oh, you got a boyfriend now? Why are you not going to the movies with this? You know, there might be a little bit of teasing, right? If those things don't work, now we're starting to see that people might, the, the friends might start being more negative. They might say negative things about you. They may withdraw. They may try to push you out of the group. They're going to stop inviting you, right? And so this is the consequence of when you resist normative social influence. When you're in a group and you start to disregard those group norms, you don't do what they're doing. You don't, you don't go along with what they're saying. You go against it. Then step one they're going to be like, let's try to bring you back into this mix. And then if that doesn't work, step two is progressively pushing you out, um, maybe possibly saying negative things about you um, to uh, basically reject you out of the group. Okay. So this is what we typically see. Now, when it comes to what is the social norm, right? Social norms can be anything. They can go, it can literally be fashion to scripts, what you say, to what you talk about, all these different things. One really uh, uh, well-known sort of normative social influence in everyday life is fashion, right? So toys, um, uh, what you wear, uh, you know, what's popular, um, you know, watching particular TV shows or going to particular movies. These are all things that we see kind of daily, right? Being a, an, an important sort of uh, factor of everyday life. And so like, here's some Crocs and, you know, Crocs have come in and out of the fashion circle. It used to be, you know, at one time Crocs were like, you know, they were everywhere. And then, so it was like, you know, 2007, 2007, it was like, that was what everybody wore, right? That was like the kids, parents, everybody wore um, Crocs and you could find them anywhere. And then you could get like little things to put in them as decoration or whatever. And then, then about five years later, like everyone hated Crocs, right? There was like, oh, why are you wearing Crocs? That's, that's like, you know, nobody wears those. Everybody had them, but nobody wore them out. Like some people would like wear them inside or something, you know? Um, and then there's a, there was an, a Facebook group called the anti croc page, right? And it had like, I don't know, over one and a half million followers, right? So there are a lot of people very anti crocs. Well, if you look now, um, it's, it's kind of back and popular again, you can still find them. My, uh, my middle son has a pair, actually, um, my two youngest all have pairs of crocs and they love to wear them around. The middle one has glitter ones, you know, it's just, uh, and then you, you can put those little, I think they call them giblets or something in it. And they're like little jewels or, um, little characters you can put in it, you know, so they, they tend to go, they'll, they'll come in and out of fashion. And, um, if you, if you wear these when they're popular, if you wear Crocs when they're popular, then, you know, you, you're part of the in crowd. If you wear them when they're not popular, then you're going against the crowd and, and you might get made fun of, you know, um, same thing with toys, you know, toys that are really popular, like a tickle me Elmo, um, troll dolls. These all used 
used to be popular. Beanie Babies were popular in the 90s. These were all things that everybody sort of had. And if you didn't have it, then, you know, you were not, you weren't cool, right? Um, in the uh, late 90s, early 2000s, we had Jinko Jeans, which are making a comeback, by the way. I've noticed really wide leg jeans are really coming back. And that was popular when, when I was a teenager, um, is wearing these uh, Jinko Jeans. And the wider the leg, the, the better they were. Um, uh, in the eighties, you know, we had the parachute pants MC hammer war. We had these, uh, I think these were more popular probably in the 20, probably 2010s or so. Um, and these were like little bracelets that you could put, but when you take them off, they look like a shape of an animal. These were really popular in the nineties and it's just chokers that are plastic. Um, these are all things that kind of come in and out, um, in the 1970s. And, uh, you saw like, um, uh, um, like hippie pants, um, like bell bottom jeans. Um, and then you see them, uh, they became popular again in like the early 2000s and they kind of go in and out late 1990s, 1990s and early 2000s. Um, they just become, you know, they become, they come in and out of fashion. And so this is kind of like a, a you know, a, a trivial sort of like, uh, um, example, but this is something where you can see where everybody starts wearing the same thing. So what do you think right now is something that you see in fashion, something that uh, everybody has or everybody wears or everybody, you know, is sort of going along with. So what's something, it could be anything. It can be a uh, purse type. It can be um, shoes. It can be a, a, a style. What do you guys see that like everybody wears? Claw hair clips, those used to be the thing back in like the nineties. Now they're coming back, right? Claw hair clips. What else do you see that are like really popular right now? So anything else where you see everybody wearing hoodies instead of jackets? Yep. Um, leggings always going to be popular because they're really comfortable. Um, anything else that you guys can think that are like really, that are really like either making a comeback or like something that you see, um, record players. Yeah. So this is an example of not fashion, but something that's become popular again. Um, and that's actually getting a physical record player and playing, um, albums, um, bell bottoms. Yeah. I was trying to think of, I was, I was calling them, um, did I say bell bottoms? I was trying to think of the word bell bottoms, but yeah, those are coming back now, bell bottoms, but yeah, chunky shoes and bell bottoms. Yeah. The nineties are making a, making a, a comeback. Um, but you know, yeah. So like you can see people like doing certain things that, um, might be like, uh, for example, charcuterie boards are really popular right now. Drinking wine. These are all things that are like fads. They're, they're things that pe everybody feels like they need to do because everybody else is doing them. Like I do not particularly like wine. I don't really like alcohol. I don't like the taste of it. And so everyone's like, oh, you know, oh, you don't drink wine. No, I don't drink wine. I don't drink beer. Um, you know, I like apple juice. That sounds good, <laughs> you know, and it's just, it's my personal preference, but when, when you don't say you, when you say, I don't do something that everybody else does, and then uh, people will start, you know, excluding you from conversations. Now, a, a lot, uh, uh, the, the, um, example where we see like, for example, uh, fashion and you know, record players and all that, that's all like, oh, you know, that's definitely something that is not really a big deal. And it's like, oh, that's conformity on a certain level. But when we talk about body influence, uh, social influence on body image, that's a big deal. Okay. Um, so when you look and then we call this sort of non-trivial, this is something that is, you know, a big, it's a big deal. Um, it's something that's trivial is like, Oh, what clothes are you wearing? It's not really a big deal. Um, so a non-trivial example of social influence is, is looking at, for example, body image. And so women it tend to, uh, you know, try to attempt to whatever, to conform to whatever their culture defines as an attractive body. And of course it depends on what culture you're in, in terms of what that body looks like. So in Western, uh, uh, cultures, like in America, for example, um, extreme thinness is, is what is considered, um, the social like accepted body stop, body type. And, it, and, you know, especially in like the nineties, uh, thinness was like very, very like sickly thin, um, was in, and then we started to get more into body positivity. Um, and then now we're actually kind of moving more into, um, 
being muscular and so more so muscular for men, but we do see, uh, women being fit, um, becoming a more sort of popular, uh, desirable trait. Right. So in, so when we see in, in Western cultures, we see that the, um, uh, you know, uh, in American culture, this thinness is more valued, but in other cultures, we see plumpness and fullness valued. And so what we value is not universal. The fact that there is a type that, that one kind of strives toward may be more of a universal characteristic, but what you strive to be is culturally determined. Um, Let's see. So I've got a comment here. Didn't medieval artists portray heavier women as more attractive because it was seen as being linked to healthy pregnancies? So yeah, there's a, there's a evolutionary psychology, uh, explanation here that, um, certain body styles like wider hips, you know, um, having more, uh, fat, you know, that you can actually, you know, see on the body is linked to healthier and more sort of reproductive capabilities. Right. Um, so there, there is an explanation for, you know, that being a desirable trait, but culture can warp that. And so, um, when we, we can actually predict the likelihood of a, um, culture, uh, uh, desiring a, plump body versus a thinner body based on food availability. So if you see a particular um, country where food is really hard to get, okay, um, then it's more likely that that culture is going to desire a more plump body. Whereas if you have a culture or a country where you have food readily available, it's really easy that, you know, you can just go down the road and get McDonald's, for example, then you're going to be more likely to see that the body style that's desired is thinner. And so I always like to think of it as what is it harder to attain, right? That is the desirable trait. So if it's really hard to get food and to be plump, then then that is going to be the more desirable body type. It's really um, easy to be bigger um, because you have to, you know, maintain a, a particular um, diet. Then that chances are you're going to see that um, the desirable, the desired body type is probably going to be thinner. And we can actually see this in the research. So you can see this here, um, looking at 54 cultures, dividing them into groups in terms of um, what is the body uh, ideal body type in that particular culture. It was uh, split into three categories, a heavy body, a moderate body, or a slender body. And when you look at the reliability of food supply in the culture, going from very unreliable, seven cultures fit into that all the way to very reliable, five cultures fit into that. And this would be like, for example, in American culture where food uh, is, is readily available for most people. Um, you're going to actually see the trends. So for example, if uh, food is very unreliable, then, in, and this is where we see that the cultures um, that fit into this category, seven of them uh, fit in there. Oh, no, none of those seven cultures valued a slender body, right? So very unreliable food source, uh, very easy to be thin because you don't have food. That's not going to be the desirable body type. Okay. Here, if, as we go into a uh, very reliable, um, uh, culture you see here is, um, so very about five cultures here, and then 40%, um, of those are going to have, uh, um, uh, the slender body as being more likely to be the one to, to that, that is desirable. Okay. Um, and so here we can see, uh, uh, you can see that the, the ratings change based off of reliability and in terms of food reliability and in terms of desirable um, um, body styles. So as the reliability of that food supply increased, the, the preference for those moderate to heavy body types decreased, right? And it was more likely that they were going to look um, for a more desirable body, ideal body type being a slender body. And we see this in American culture as well. Um, and so, um, the, the, the hypothesis is that in those societies where food is, is pretty scarce, is frequently scarce, a heavy body would be considered more uh, the most beautiful because these women had enough to eat and therefore were more likely to be healthy and fertile. Okay. Um, so does anybody have any questions about that at all? Or is everybody, so give me a thumbs up if you feel pretty good about that. So the more reliable the food, the more likely that the um, body style, the ideal body type is going to be a thinner body. And 
when you have less reliable food, you're going to, your that culture is more likely going to be, um, looking for a heavier body as an ideal st- uh, body type. So does anybody have any questions about that? So give me a thumbs up if you feel pretty good about that. Good, good, good. Okay. All right. So let's look at this and you, we can actually see this across, um, in the U S, uh, looking at, um, like, uh, looking at sort of archival archival analysis. Um, so, uh, if you look at mean average bust to waste ratios of models that are in magazines like Vogue and ladies home journal. Um, and we can look at this over the course of 80 years. So this was 1901 all the way to 1981. And so, um, the yellow is uh, ladies home journal. And then the green is Vogue. So these are really similar types of, of, of magazines. And the idea is, is that there are certain points in time where the models and, and the idea is, is that the models are going to reflect the cultural standard of that time. So if the models are very thin, very have a low, you know, bust to race, uh, bust to waste ratio, then that means that at the time, the culture probably the, the society at the time valued that particular body style. So if they were really, really thin, that in the models and the magazines were really thin, then probably that's what people wanted to see. So here um, you can see that early on, there was a, a pretty high average bus to waste ratio here um, in the early 1900s. And if you think about American history, um, you know, that being kind of the, you know, wanting the, the healthier, uh, you know, um, uh, wider hips, bigger breasts, you know, if we think about what was happening in the early 1900s, you know, food was not very reliable during this time. Um, you know, we were talking, you know, thinking about war, thinking about rations, you know, all those sorts of things. Um, and the great depression and things like that, you know, food was, was, was relatively scarce. So you can actually see this happen within over time, within a particular culture or country, um, as well as across different cultures as well. So here, we have that, you know, that, that a, a fuller body was, was more, um, prevalent in the, these different magazines. And then we see a really big drop here. Now, if you're familiar with like flapper girls in the 1920s, um, there was a really big push for rail thin, like thin all the way down. Right. So no, butt, no chest, just super, super skinny. Um, that was the, the, um, the ideal body type for the, for the 1920s. And, um, again, you know, kind of looking at, uh, food availability at this time, probably much more available than, you know, 10 years prior. And so that is the desirable body type. And then as we went, you know, as we go into, for example, into, uh, world war two, we see the pinup girls being a plumper, you know, st- style. And again, food scarcity probably being a, a, an issue during this time as well. Um, we see that, you know, that, that relationship happening there. And then of course we see a drop off in the 1970s with models like Twiggy who are again, very thin, and then it really dipping in the 1980s. And then in the 1990s, again, being very, very thin, being more the ideal body style. So these are definitely trends that we can see over time. And in a good way to see this, is through things like magazines and media and what was, what was, uh, you know, kind of being advertised. And so, you know, models wearing clothes that were just, you know, um, you know, falling off their body basically, cause they were so thin. These are things that we can certainly see over time. And if we look at how women are seeing things in media, like for example, in the eighties and seventies and all that, um, we are seeing that being, um, a trend, uh, and then we can see it today in media, but also in social media. And so we're going to talk a little bit about that. I got a comment. Why are women's bodies in particular being judged? Well, you know, if we look at our, you know, our culture and the way that, you know, socially that we raise our children, you know, we raise our children to be a certain way. Uh, if you have a baby, you know, you're going to be like, oh, look at that strong little boy. And it could be the same exact baby. And you're going to be like, oh, she's so feminine, the feminine, you know, and it's just kind of how our culture looks at gender. Um, we can also look at this in, as, as an evolutionary um, perspective explanation by saying, um, you know, women's bodies have always been critiqued because they're the ones who are, uh, you know, carrying children and babies and, you know, 
and looking at mate selection and preference, you know, that's always been more of an important thing than looking at male bodies. Um, and that's just kind of like, so we could look at it from kind of an evolutionary perspective. We can look at it a cultural, a social perspective. Um, I'm not saying that it's right or that we should only focus on women's bodies. There's definitely more focus on men's bodies today than there was, you know, decades ago. Um, and so men are, are um, absolutely getting, you know, um, judgment from their bodies. And right now, if we look at our culture, uh, that judgment is being more muscular, right? So for women, it tends to be on, you know, thinness and, uh, you know, uh, how they're kind of, uh, caring for themselves. And if they're, you know, putting on makeup, if they're, uh, taking care of their, their features and stuff, whereas men, it's more of like, you know, having a more muscular body type. And we're going to talk about that in a minute and how boys see that reflected in toys and things. So we're going to get to that in just a second. So informational social influence can tell women, um, yeah, men do get judged for being too skinny. Um, but we actually have started to see that, um, men are at an increasing rate having, um, eating disorders because, uh, you know, they want to, they, they might have body dysmorphia and not be happy with their body. So they can, you know, they can absolutely have issues with, um, maintaining a healthy body weight as well. Definitely not reserved for women. We just tend to see women as having a higher percentage of that. So, um, yeah, that's definitely, um, a factor in there. So if we look at an informational social influence, so this is how we learn what is the ideal body style, right? So we learn what's considered attractive. We learn uh, that within our own culture, but we also learn that in other cultures, right? So when we consider uh, who we're comparing ourselves to, right? So just in kind of our, our, our sort of, um, our, our world, our sort of world, as we see kind of right in front of us, you know, we're comparing ourselves to things like our, um, our parents, we're seeing, uh, comparing to grandparents, we're comparing to friends and family members. Um, and they, and we're looking at them to see how are they talking about their own bodies? So if you grow up with a mom, for example, who is always like, trying to diet and trying to watch your weight, um, you know, that's going to affect how you view your own body. But we also, so we're learning from the people who are right in front of us, but we're also learning from, um, people who are, um, you know, in our, uh, bigger world, right? So those who are in, um, that were, they're falling on social media, those who were watching on TV, you know, all of these things are going to affect how we view our own bodies and how we learn about what body style is more attractive. Um, so, uh, we, we, we can learn this through media, social media, all those things. Um, now what's interesting is that other cultures are looking at other cultures, ideal body styles. And as for example, Western culture starts to be, uh, kind of viewed across Eastern cultures, we're starting to see some of it bleed into their own culture. So for example, Japanese women, if you look um, at how Japanese women valued beauty, um, prior to the 1940s. So in, um, like mid 1940s in world war II, compared to how it's viewed now, there's a really big difference there. And so, um, as we see over time where there's more access, so, you know, over, you know, from, you know, exposure to Western culture through, um, Americans being in Japan and in, uh, different countries for, uh, um, for the military, for example. And then now we start to see social media being worldwide and other cultures seeing what Western culture looks like. Um, now we're starting to see big differences in, um, how these beauty standards change. So we're seeing, for example, traditional Japanese beauty standards looking a particular way. Um, and then now it's starting to become more Western. So looking at, for example, um, uh, uh change. So, uh, looking at, um, eye shape, looking at jaw shape, face shape. So, um, there are people who go through very radical surgeries, um, doing things like, um, really extensive, uh, plastic surgery to change 
from a rounder face to a more teardrop face or to a thinner chin. If you, uh, there's a lot of uh, influencers on TikTok, for example, who use a very specific, and these can be uh, Japanese um, or different Asian cultures. Uh, um, they actually use a filter to to sharpen the chin, and you can, and then they use tape and all sorts of things if they don't want to do or can't afford a plastic surgery. We actually see these standards are changing in other cultures to be more like what we see in western cultures and so social uh informational social influence is changing beauty standards across different cultures and that can be of course that can be a really that can be a really big thing so for a westernized look okay we're seeing things like um, long legs, a longer body style, right? Um, we're seeing a uh, different kind of uh, uh, face shape, eye shape. We're seeing um, uh, more pressure to be thin, whereas in Japan before, you know, prior to World War II, we saw maybe a plumper body style. Now we're seeing a thinner body style. And so <clears throat> these are really interesting kind of uh, changes to different cultures. And these are becoming normative, right? So now in Japanese culture, um, you know, wanting to conform to American culture is going to change how they are viewing themselves and how they're going about that change. Now we also see this happening, of course, within our own culture. Um, and we see this happening in normative social influence. So we have informational social influence where other cultures are learning about Western culture and changing their beauty standards. We also see this happening through normative social influence. And what is it a part of the group that is normal? What is the script? What is the social norm across uh, the group? One thing that we see happening, for example, in sororities is that can be problematic developing group norms of thinness, for example, because what can happen is, is that those sorority members can develop things like eating disorders because they're trying to maintain a body shape and style that is the norm for their group. And so we find things like binge eating, um, we might see anorexia, um, we might see that the new members are trying to conform to the sororities group norms because they want to be accepted by the group. And so things like um, eating disorders like bulimia, um, for example, bulimia is a good example because that's uh, factoring in like binge eating and then purging, um, using things. So purging, fasting, um, vomiting, use of laxatives to try to maintain a particular body shape or style. And so we actually do see this happening in um, in sororities, you know, across the, the, the U S. Um, and we're also finding too, that there's a mix of, of social influence happening here, because if you look at a new sorority member, for example, coming in, um, it's very, very likely that the initial conforming behavior is actually due to informational social influence because a new pledge is learning um, information about how to manage their weight and what is the expectation for a sorority member, what is the expectation for this particular group. So that's informational social influence, kind of learning that whole process and what's going on. And then as they are into that group and, and start to learn what the social norms are. Now they're trying to match their behaviors and might that might be binging behaviors, that might be purging behaviors. They're going to match that behavior to the sorority standards and that of their friends. That now has essentially evolved from informational social influence into normative social influence. So they're both leading to conformity but it's a matter of like what is the where is it starting and how does it evolve uh, later on. So that's women, right? So that's more women image. Now let's talk about men's body image because it's, it's, we don't often talk about, uh, you know, eating disorders or um, um, issues with body dysmorphia in men. And that is a huge deal because especially as we look at bo body positivity, we have to think about body positivity, not just for women, but for men as well, for all genders, right? And so over time, the cultural norms for men's bodies have changed. And so right now we're seeing this kind of muscular, you know, gym rat kind of thing being more 
more popular. And so men are going to feel this pressure to achieve this ideal body uh, uh, that, that they see, similar to how women are experiencing this pressure to, to have this ideal body style. So it might be for men, it might be a six pack, you know, um, it might be uh, being in the gym six days a week, right? And so what happens is, is that when, when, when men can't achieve it, they're going to do things that are going to speed up the process, or it's going to make it easier. So they might do things like use uh, steroids, for example, um, or ephedrine to try to get that look. And so um, if you look at uh, how people are changing their, their, their habits, right, to have a more muscular physique, there was a, a study that was done not too long ago that saw um, 21 to 42 percent of young men have altered their eating habits in order to gain muscle um, or weight because they were too thin or they weren't muscular enough. About 12 to 26 percent have actually dieted to reduce their weight because they might be considered overweight or they might get teased for that or whatever. So we know that informational and normative social influences are being um, are, are of course operating on men just as they are on women because it's affecting their perceptions of their body's attractiveness. And if we look at toys, right? So toys, if we look at girls' toys, like Barbie dolls, um, you know, they, there was a, there was a, uh, an interesting sort of documentary not too long ago that looks at how a Barbie doll shape and looking at it proportioned is literally impossible to do in a human body. The, I think the woman would be like seven foot five and it just, the proportions were way, way off. Um, and so looking at the Barbie dolls now and like the Disney princesses and looking at things like Moana, for example, um, Moana is a different body style than the previous princesses, um, looking at a Mirabelle and Encanto and looking at, you know, this sort of more representative body styles, really getting, um, 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 at is body positivity. I got a comment here terms like bulking and cutting in men's fitness. Are these eating disorders in disguise or are they healthy? Um, well, I mean, they, it, they're unhealthy habits, right? So, uh, bulking up, you know, uh, trying to, um, take, pre-workouts and post-workouts can be very unhealthy if done, if not done in moderation, doing things like yo-yo diets, trying to, um, bulk up, you know, this, this week, cut down next week, that is very unhealthy for your body. So those practices and behaviors can be very unhealthy. Um, but you know, having a, a muscular physique is not necessarily unhealthy. It's just, what are you doing to get there and how is it taking over your life and body dysmorphia is looking at your body and basically never really being happy with it because you can never attain these sort of unattainable goals. And so, you know, kind of keeping that in mind that you can be absolutely healthy and have a healthy sort of mental health and, and view of your own body, but that has to be done in moderation. It has to be done in a healthy way. And when you start to obsess over your health and obsess over your eating habits, that is a, that's a disorder in of itself is this kind of obsession with how many calories are am I getting? What are my macros? Um, you know, how many calories am I burning? How many, um, you know, how much, uh, um, protein am I taking in? If that starts to take over your life, that can be problematic. So going back to toys. So this right here, this is an example of, uh, just a, a regular sort of toy that a boy, typically boy related toy. Right. Um, and so this would be like, okay, if you measure the waist, the chest and biceps of the action figure toys that, you know, have been, you know, really popular over the last three decades, um, you're going to find that, that, so if you look at, for example, the, um, physique of a toy in, you know, 2010 versus the physique of a toy in 1970, you're going to see that they, they've bulked up, you know, they've really, really bulked up. And these are very unrealistic, um, images because they're exceeding even like the, the, <clears throat> the bodybuilders of the biggest humans that we have, they're still even unattainable for them. And so that's a problem because that sets the wrong image for boys that, oh, you need to look like this. And that's physically impossible. Just like we see with girls and Barbie dolls and seeing there's no way I can, I can be that thin or I can be that proportion because that's just physically not possible. Um, 
So does anybody have any questions about like body style and that? Cause now we're going to move into more about normative social influence, but um, likelihood of conforming. So if anybody, does anybody have any questions? We're going to talk about the factors when it comes to conforming and likelihood. Does anybody have any questions? Give me a thumbs up. Feel pretty good. Um, I have a comment because um, along with the Disney princesses, my uh -huh. baby cousins, they have Barbies and their bodies are starting to change as well to be more um, like a more of a diverse range of women's mm -hmm. bodies. So I thought that was really cool. Yep. We're, we're definitely seeing that in the toys now, which is, um, so not only representative across body style and type, but representative across hair, hair types, um, skin color, you know, and this is really great for kids to be exposed to things, especially if they're not in a majority, right? If they're able to get a, a doll that looks like them, uh, whether it's body shape or hairstyle, you know, this representation is really important for people to feel seen. And they feel like that, oh, okay, that's what I look like, or that's what my mom looks like, or that's what my dad looks like. And so it's really nice to kind of see um, that these uh, toy manufacturing companies are starting to reflect that in the toys that are coming out. So yeah, no, that's great. That's, that's great that you're, you're seeing that and observing that as well. Okay, so let's look at some of the factors that come into play of the likelihood of you conforming, right? So we have this idea of the social impact theory, and this is that there are certain factors that um, are have to be in place to make it more or less likely for social influence to actually have an effect on you, okay? So number one is um, strength, okay? So how important is that group to you? Are you in a group with strangers? Are you in a group of people that you know and you love very, very much? Um, what is, you know, what is that relationship of those members of the group to you? So strength is important. Immediacy is important. So when something is more immediate, like we talked about like a crisis situation, we talked about, you know, having to think fast, you're going to be more likely to conform, right? So you, you are, tend to be more likely to conform when the strength of the group is, it's very strong to you. Like you have a very strong connection. You're going to be more likely to conform if the immediacy is, um, like you have to act very fast then you tend to be more conform to, to conform more. Um, and it depends on the number of people in the group. So there's, it, it's an actually really interesting thing here. There's a cap to this. There's actually a kind of a cap to this because the fewer there are, the, the fewer, um, no, members of the group there are, the less likely you're going to conform up to a certain point. And as you start to add members, you're going to be more likely to conform, but then there's kind of like a cutoff. So we're going to talk about that here in a minute. So here is if you were in a group, okay, this is the group, um, and you only have like one other person right in the group, uh, you're probably not going to conform. You're not going to really go along with, with that person. And then as you start to add people in the group who are disagreeing with you, you're going to be much more likely to conform until you hit a cap. So here between about, mm, you know, six or seven, six to eight people, that's really like the cap at that point, adding more people to the group, isn't going to change your likelihood of conforming. Okay. So if you have a group of people and you have two people, uh, other people in the group, and those two people are disagreeing with you, you're going to be less likely to conform than if five other people were disagreeing with you, right? But then if you have 15 people disagreeing with you, you're going to be no more likely to conform than if the group was just, you know, six or seven. So the number of people in the group actually does impact your likelihood to conform. Um, so <clears throat> when we talk about this group size, right? So this is kind of just what I was saying here. As you increase the number of the group, especially those who are disagreeing with you or who are something that you're you're trying to decide to conform to, um, as you increase the members, it's going to increase your likelihood up until about mm, five, six. Then it's like at that point, conformity doesn't really increase that much after that because that's kind of the, the cap. Um, does anybody have any questions about that? I kind of went through that kind of fast, but that's a pretty, I think that's a pretty simple concept. The more people you have in a group, the more likely you're going to conform. I think that's, that's pretty common sense, but there is kind of a cap on that. 
So that was one thing that we talked about, one of the factors. The other factor is the importance of the group, the strength of the group, right? So when you have a cost to being rejected by the group, so you really care about this group, whether it's you love them because they're their, your family or they're really close friends or you respect them and you want them to respect you back, that that strength of the relationship is going to impact the likelihood of you conforming. So you're going to be more likely to conform nor to normative pressures um, when those people have a strong connection to you. Okay. Because there's a cost to losing them. Whereas if you have a group of strangers and you go against the strangers, you're never going to see them again. And so, yeah, you might conform, but you're going to be a little less likely to conform to a group of strangers because you know, if they don't, if they think you're an idiot and you never see him again, it's like, okay, well that hurt my feelings. But when you have a family member, who's like, I never want to see you again, because you're not conforming to social norms, then that's going to change, you know, your likelihood of conforming. Now, when you have a group that's really highly cohesive, okay. Um, and they, and everybody kind of wants to, to get along, there's going to be, um, there's going to be less likely to want to rock the boat. So more people are going to conform in this group. Okay. Um, they, uh, they can make less logical decisions because nobody wants to argue. Nobody wants to upset that relationship. So when you have a really cohesive group where everybody's getting along and nobody wants to rock the boat, then everybody's gonna be like, Oh, sure. Yeah. We'll go with that. Oh yeah. Yeah. That sounds good. You know? Um, so for example, if you're like uh, severely lactose intolerant, right. And, and everybody wants to go to like an Italian restaurant and you know that everything and you know, everything that you're going to eat probably is dairy in it. Um, you're not going to rock that boat, even though, you know, that's, that's something that you don't want to conform to. You're going to be more likely. And that's not a logical decision for you because you're going to hurt, <laughs> you know, after dinner, um, you're going to be more likely to go with the group because you don't want to upset anybody. You don't want to upset any relationships. Now, when you have a situation where you don't have anybody on your side, you don't have an ally. Okay. You're going to be a lot more likely to conform. Okay. Think about it this way. Um, if you are in, uh, let's say you, uh, want your, during the pandemic, you were really big about wearing your mask. Okay. And you wore your mask everywhere. And then you went into a situation where nobody is wearing their mask and you might not actually know these people at all, but you're in a, maybe in a social situation and you're wearing your mask, you walk in and nobody's wearing their mask. Okay. Um, you're going to feel awkward. There's nobody else wearing their mask. You might be much more likely to take your mask off just so that you don't feel as awkward in that group setting. Now, if you had an ally, so if you look over and somebody sees you wearing their mask, your mask, and then they put a mask on, now you have an ally because that person is kind of like, you're like doing the same thing. So now you're going to be less likely to take your mask off and conform to everybody else. Even if you have a dozen people and they're all wearing masks, you've got at least one or two people who are your allies who are along with you and, and following along with you, you're going to be less likely to conform. So they did this in the ASH studies. So what they they did is they had um, a lot of people who were uh, uh, going against saying the wrong answer, right? So they would have, they changed, they varied the number of people in terms of who was giving the wrong answer. And then they would have a couple of people who were giving the right answer. So when you had an ally, somebody else giving the right answer, then you are not alone in your answer. And so conformity dropped to 6%. Remember it's 32% before, 6%. When you had an ally, you're going to be like, you know what? I'm not alone in this. This other person thinks that's the right answer. I'm going to go along uh, and not conform to the six or seven other people who are saying the wrong answer. So if you have somebody who is an ally in the group, you're going to be much less likely to conform to the majority because you feel comfortable that you have somebody on your side. You're going to be much more likely to resist that normative social influence because now you're have more self-confidence and you're kind of emboldened to resist that uh that normative social influence because somebody else is also resisting it now what happens when you don't have an ally as you can imagine um it's uncomfortable right and you don't want if nobody is going against you you don't want to be the dissenter we can actually look at this in the us supreme court decisions so there was a content analysis of all the supreme court decisions from 1953 to 2001 and what this is this is 4178 decisions 
okay? And it involved 29 different justices. And what they found is the most common decision was nine to zero. Okay, so the most common decision was nine to zero where everybody was, you know, on the same boat and there was no dissenters. Okay, that constituted 35% of their decision. So that's unanimous. Okay, so a unanimous decision is all nine said, we agree with this and we go, we, we, we judge this, right? We, um, we go with this decision, no dissenters. The least common decision was one where it was an eight one split. So we had one dissenter that was only 10% of the decisions in the span of 48 years. So 35% was the most common in having unanimous decision. And only 10% was when you had one justice who went uh, uh, against the other eight justices. So it's really difficult. It's really difficult to be the person who is saying, I am going this direction away from the crowd. Okay. You, it, it's very hard to do that. It's very awkward. It doesn't feel right. Okay. Now, another thing that we find uh, happening with social influence is it can be very dangerous. Now, this is where this kind of bonus activity comes in. If you look on Moodle, you'll see that there is a bonus activity uh, posted uh, about propaganda. So pay close attention to this so that we can uh, make sure we have a really good uh, participation in that. So it's, it's an optional um, activity, uh, but it's worth a few uh, extra po points. It's a bonus activity. So propaganda, this is um, where you have uh, something, it might be a written thing, it might be a verbalized, it might be a picture. This is a, some systematic attempt to manipulate thoughts and behaviors. And so I'm telling you right now, if you guys just just like pay attention on social media, you're going to see this everywhere. And a lot of times we don't re recognize propaganda until we've seen some examples. And now we're starting to recognize it and you see it everywhere, especially when you look at, at, at times of war. So like, for example, right now, today, we see Russian propaganda against Ukrainians in right now you can you can see it if you go uh you know on on um, media sources if you go on reddit you're going to see the propaganda and it's and it's blatant okay this is a way to uh warp people's thoughts and and minds about in this case for example during war groups of people okay so in the 1930s the nazi regime really really like jumped on this propaganda thing right so propaganda defined is the deliberate systematic attempt to shape perceptions manipulate cognitions and direct behavior to achieve a response that furthers the desired intent of the propagandist so in this case what um these uh, uh um the, the, this group was doing the, the Nazis were trying to warp citizens' views on different groups of people, for example, Jewish people. Okay, so Adolf Hitler knew the power of propaganda and used it as a tool of the state. Okay, so in a totalitarian fascist fascist regime, regime okay, um, the state is the expert. Okay, so people will look to the state for guidance and for information. And so it's always present, it's always there, it's always right, and it always needs to be obeyed, right? When you have a society like this or, or a rule like this. So propaganda would persuade Germans through informational conformity. So they learned facts, right? Which were not true, but facts about, um, for example, Jewish people, and they learned solutions to what um, the Nazis had defined as the Jewish question. So we saw things like people saying, um, the propaganda saying, Jews took our jobs, you know, you know, don't trust these people because they're out to get you. They're doing this, they're doing that, they're bad, right? And so this propaganda fed into all these lies and started to shape how people are viewing this group of people. We see this happening in Russia right now, where they're trying to say that, oh, Ukraine is, is killing their own people and they're doing this, whatever, that's all propaganda. It's all lies so that Russian citizens will believe what's going on, um, you know, that, that what's not really happening happening in Ukraine. So there were things like um, youth groups, for example. So in, in, um, in the 1940s, youth groups were encouraged to spy on their own parents, um, report them to the Gestapo if they were not good uh, citizens, 
right? Um, and so people like neighbors, coworkers, salespeople, uh, you know, people that own shops, they were supposed to sort of patrol it and report if anybody's being disloyal. And so they were really buying into this because they were seeing this as fact because they they saw the um, Nazi regime as the experts, right? So things like rejection, uh, being ostracized, being even tortured or killed, these were really strong motivators for things like um, normative conformity because um, that was what's motivating people. Uh, if I don't report them, then I'm going to get in trouble and they're going to kill me or they're going to hurt my family, right? So Propaganda works on two levels. It works on informational social influence because it's it's building on this incorrect information and it is uh, building on pre-existing beliefs, sometimes stereotypes, things like that. And it's giving you factual, even though it's not factual, information about groups of people. And then what happens is, is that um, it, it we can actually see people uh, um, conforming and also privately accepting these views because these are facts and information that they didn't know previously or they fit into this particular narrative. Now, we also see propaganda happening on a normative social influence level where um, you know, these are the norms. This is what you do. Everybody reports on somebody who's being disloyal. This is what the, the normal is. This is what the norms are, right? Oh, you see somebody that's not uh, acting in line. What is acting in line? Um, you know, uh, uh, paying, you know, your taxes or your dues to the Nazi regime, making sure that you um, uh, do a salute every time somebody passes, right? These are all things that are part of the social norms at the time. And if you don't do it, you're going to be ostracized, rejected, you're going to get in trouble, right? So propaganda and these techniques are, are working on two different social influence levels, which makes them even more dangerous, right? Um, because if you don't follow it, you're going to get hurt, you're going to get in trouble. Um, and in some cases with informational social influence, you actually believe it. And so you, 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 you follow through because you just, you think that must be the case, right? Now, here are some silly examples of propaganda. So we talk about like, um, uh, you know, just like some silly memes you might see out, like, for example, duck face, and it's like duck lips kill erections, you know, it's not, you know, nobody, nobody wants to see it. it's not, it's not sexy, right? So that would be an example of kind of a silly propaganda technique. So it's trying to give you information about don't do this thing anymore, because nobody, nobody thinks it's attractive, right? Um, this right here, this is an, this is the enemy looking at Mario and um, playing into like, uh, um, uh, you know, Nintendo games and stuff. So these are kind of more um, like lower key, kind of sillier propaganda. But if we look at historically, and these are, you're not allowed to use these on your, on your, um, on your, uh, uh, your, your activity, by the way, you have to find your own and don't just Google and find the first ones. You need to be able to explain it. You need to be able to tell me why they're propaganda. Um, so you can't just like make pictures and, and, and run with that. So these are a few actual real examples. Um, so here it's, uh, you know, don't talk rats have big ears. This was something that, um, and if you look in the background, it's the Japanese flag. So this was supposed to, the rat was supposed to represent Japanese. Um, and this is some, this is uh, propaganda to say that you have no idea who, uh, if you see a person who looks Japanese, assume that they're the enemy, right? Um, don't say anything about anything that you know about war or anything that you know because um japanese spies can hear what you're saying and or they might take this back to uh you know um their their country and so this was huge propaganda and actually ended up resulting in a lot of people getting hurt and um uh because at the time and during world war ii um japanese were put in internment camps on U.S. soil, right? So anybody that looked Japanese was considered the enemy, and they were they were ostracized, rejected. They were saying, "Oh, you know, we know that anybody who is Japanese is 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 against the United States." When that wasn't the case, we have people who were born in the United States and just so happened to look Japanese, or perhaps were Japanese, had family Japanese who were Japanese, and they were being ostracized and put in internment camps because they were considered dangerous. We saw the same thing happening. You can actually see propaganda from um, when uh, right around 9/11 and people against anybody that looked um, Middle Eastern, Arab, you know, everybody, if you're wearing a turban, then you were, you know, dangerous. And so this kind of propaganda is really, really dangerous because people can get hurt um, and people can um, get, you know, uh, get, uh, get, 
have a lot of, of really, really uh, physically bad things happen to them, to all, but also mental health as well. Um, here we have a propaganda against marijuana. Now, remember, marijuana wasn't always illegal, right? Um, and so they'll say, oh, it's, you know, it's the, 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 the devil and it's going to and, you know, it's going to, it's the devil's harvest. It's going to, you know, warp your children and it's going to do all these, these horrible things. Um, so this is actually a poster for a movie uh, called Devil Heart, Devil's Harvest, um, because marijuana was outlawed at the national level um, in the U.S. in 1937. And so, um, this is a poster for a movie uh, for propaganda that came out in the 1930s that tried to intimidate the public so that they wouldn't use the drug illegally. Um, but again, you can see stuff like this uh, all over the place, depending on what is currently like, you know, happening in um, in society. So how is it that you can resist propaganda, normative social influence, informational social influence? How do you how do you resist it? Right. Um, first of all, be aware that it exists. Be aware that propaganda is social, um, um, is informational social influence, and that's trying to warp what you think, right? Um, try to be aware of when um, uh, inappropriate normative social influence is happening, when everybody's doing something and you should not follow along. Uh, take action. Number one, find an ally. We know that the more allies you have that's going against the, the norm, the more likely, uh, the less likely you're going to be to conform. And just like we talked about when it came to like, if you have a group and you're doing something and you go against it, a lot of times you have what we call earned, um, idi uh, idiosyncrasy credits. These are like, um, these are like uh, tokens that you earn to go against the grain. So if everybody's like, oh, oh, let's go uh, see this movie. And you're like, and so maybe you have four friends and all four friends are like, we want to go see this movie. And you're like, no, I want to go see this movie. There, you're allowed a few of those, right? And nobody's going to say anything. There's no consequence to that. They're, they're, you know, they're, they're, they have a tolerance built to being able to go against the grain um, to a certain point, right? And so you can defy the group and not conform and still be accepted and not rejected and, and no problems. And these idiosyncrasy credits are ones that you earn over time um, because this, because you have been following the norms of this group for an, uh, a while. And so th these are sort of earned over a period of time. Um, okay. I have, um, let's see, I want to talk about obedience, um, but we're not going to have time for that. Um, so I'm going to actually, I'm going to cut here and I'm going to see, I can't remember if I have a video at this point, um, that talks about the rest of this. I'm going to check this. And if I don't, I'll, I'll do a video for the last few slides. Um, but I want to see if anybody has any questions, cause I've gone over a lot of concepts in a short period of time, and I want to make sure that nobody is confused about anything. So I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording.